Welcome to this episode of the Revolution and Ideology Podcast. I'm Nick Lee. And I'm Jared Benson. In this episode, we are going to be briefly discussing uh, Murray Bookchin's concept of communalism. Uh, Jared has received, I didn't intentionally did not send him any readings or background information on today's topic. Uh, so I'm going to just go through a brief introduction and we'll be getting his thoughts on it live without any uh, previous uh, readings or information at all. I'm going to be uh, reading a series of quotes as we go through this. All of the quotes that I'm reading from today come from uh, Bookchin's writing Toward a Communalist Approach, which was written sometime uh, in 2006. We'll put this in the show notes for you to read. Uh, it's really accessible and pretty short. It's about 20, 22 pages, something like that. Uh, so definitely a quick read. Um, basically, this is Bookchin's new theory for social change and social organization. He starts out by providing a critique of Marxism and anarchism, which I'll skip mostly here. We don't need uh, his critiques of those two theories. It is interesting. I didn't actually know about this till I started researching Bookchin more, that he breaks away from anarchism towards the end of his life. And his theory of communalism is basically his new theory for what he thinks uh, should happen. I am going to, though, the jumping off point is going to be uh, answering the question that he basically does, which is why we need a new theory beyond um, Marxism and anarchism. And he provides three main points. He says, capitalism has changed, first of all. His first critique of Marxism is that it applies really well to like the period uh, after the Industrial Revolution when Marx is writing, but not really well to uh, modern times. So he says, quote, Significantly, capitalism has changed in many respects since World War II. It has created new generalized social issues that are not limited to wages, hours, and working conditions, notably environmental, gender, hierarchical, civil, and democratic issues. The problems raised by these issues cut across class lines, even as they exacerbate or modify the problems that once gave rise to the classical revolutionary movements. He says, as a result of these changes that our definition of freedom has changed as well. Quote, Older definitions of freedom while preserving certain unassailable components became inadequate in the light of later historical advances. So too, older revolutionary theories and movements, while losing none of their insights and lessons, become inadequate with the passage of time as the emergence of new issues necessitate broader programs and movements. Then finally, he says, the proletariat are no longer the revolutionary class. He suggests that this term itself is outdated, quote, nor can the proletariat whose class identity is being subverted by an immense middle class hope to speak for the majority of the population. Capitalism is inflicting generalized threats on humanity, sweeping problems such as globalization, climate changes that may alter the very face of the planet, challenges to civil rights and traditional freedoms, and the radical transformation of civic life are a result of rampant urbanization. Other issues have yet to emerge as a result of the immensely transformative technologies that will make the coming century unrecognizable. A new revolutionary movement must be capable of dealing not only with the more familiar issues that linger on, but with the new, more general ones that potentially may bring the vast majority of society into opposition to an ever-evolving and challenging capitalist system. So what do you think about those main reasons that he says we need a new revolutionary theory there's a lot there to digest so i may have you have to do like a little bit of a recap for me um but right off the bat one thing that kind of like jumped out to me um was his critique of using 19th century language um to combat 21st uh well 20th and then 21st century problems uh that's one of my main criticisms for the various layers of marxists we seem to uh swim in and out of um and uh and yeah i mean it's it's very difficult you you can't use the same terminology you can't use the over the same oversimplified way of looking at the world between bourgeoisie and proletariat it, it, it's it's dated. It's it's gone. I, again, we talked about it in an earlier podcast. I don't remember what episode it was, but yeah, it, it Marx laid down some very important groundwork for us regarding like historical materialism and, and understanding, of course, the way things function. But as far as the specific idea of the socialist slash eventual socialist revolution turned whatever communist democracy or, or dictatorship of the proletariat or choose your terminology, they're all relatively interchangeable at this point. And I get that I've probably ruffled some feathers there by saying they're interchangeable. 
but all of these people are talking about the same thing and, and we're acting like we're still dealing with like, you know, especially in the developed world, right? This industrial revolution mentality. It's gone. It's not coming back. Can we try and make like blanket statements that there is still a proletariat? But is that the, how complex is that proletariat? Is it the guy that works for like whatever defense contractor Raytheon filling out Excel spreadsheets and the Taco Bell employee and somewhere in the middle? What would that be? Like middle management at Sears? Like, I mean, is that all proletariat? Do they all have the same experiences? It's 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 not going to work anymore, right? We have to evolve. So that's my first thing. Um, I really do appreciate him calling this out because it's it's gone, right? Hammer and sickle is not going to be a thing. I mean, the other one was capitalism has changed, which I think we don't even need to. No, I mean, it's definitely changed. And that's actually, uh, you know, if I want to give it some sort of credit for whatever reason, it is highly malleable. And, and for that purpose, this ideology slash economic system slash uh, infiltra- in, in, infiltrator of the political system has proven to be ridiculously malleable. We always like to use that example, right? Like um, how at one point, what do we like to use? Oh, regarding music, hip hop, right? How at one point hip hop was music of resistance and then all of a sudden now we're using it to be fancy, right? Like, you know, if we want to talk about Iggy Azalea or whatever, like Gucci, 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 Gucci. It's, I mean, that's that's how malleable it is. It can take anything, even movements that, that, that are seeking to challenge like the prevailing ideology and of course systems that are attached to it and ramifications of those systems and then some somehow like absorb them and then regurgitate them by co-opting them. I mean, it's actually for that purpose, I would argue, yeah, you got to give, I guess, capitalism some credit in that regard. But here's the key, right? Like the climate is, is the clincher, right? Yes. It, people have been suffering for a very long time and, and capitalism is not like the only thing that we can blame. Our ideologies class goes through numerous ideologies that predate capitalism that led to uh, insane um, acts of, of, human rights violations uh, across time and space, imperialism and colonialism. And some would argue regarding colonialism that that was just feeding capitalism. But regardless, like these ideologies and the way people that that operated in them, that predates capitalism. But the one that's really driving it home more more than any is is what capitalism, capitalism's war on the earth, right? Like that's that's the thing that, that we have to understand. Uh, makes this so much different now and why looking at it through the lens of what some would call is uh, an industrialist Marxist lens is not going to be a way for us to move forward by any stretch of the imagination. So right right now, I'm, yeah, I'm, and you didn't send me anything on I remained intentionally ignorant, but I'm a fan right now of this guy. So Bookchin. And like what we know about Bookchin in general is uh, this is part of his theory of social ecology. So if Marx, you say, is coming from from an industrialist lens, then Bookchin very clearly is coming from an ecological and environmentalist lens for sure. We know that already just based on some of the other readings and research we know about Bookchin already. Um, Okay. You, you, you know. I don't know shit. All right. (laughs) Um, So what is communalism? Let's jump into it and get right to it. I just have bullet points and quotes so we can begin to get an understanding of this theory and how it goes down. I do appreciate he provides like a tactical way for this, how this should be implemented. So we'll build up to that. First off, the emphasis is on cities. He uses the term municipalities. Uh, He says, quote, Socialist revolutionary theory seldom attributed an important place to municipalities. On closer inspection, the civic nature of most modern revolutions points to the fundamental role that municipalities have played as incubators of social development and the functions they have performed in fulfilling uh, humanity's potentialities. Communalism not only recaptures these functions, but it goes beyond them as an effort to constitute the developmental arena of mind and discourse. By contrast, modern urbanized cities reduce citizens to mere co-dwellers who live in close physical proximity to one another or to taxpayers who expect the city to provide them with goods and services in return for revenue. As such, communalism sees the municipality as the potentially as potentially a transformative development beyond organic evolution into the domain of social evolution. Indeed, for communalists, the municipality is the domain wherein mere adaptation to changing environments is supplanted by proactive association based on the free exchange of ideas, the creative endeavor to bring consciousness to the service of change, and the collective vehicle where necessary to intervene in the world with a view toward ending environmental as well as economic uh, insults. The municipality, once it is freed from hierarchical domination and material exploitation, indeed, once it is recreated as a rational arena for human creativity in all spheres of life, is potentially the ethical space for the good life. 
It is also potentially the school for the trans for the formation of a new human being, the citizen who has shed the archaic blood ties of tribalism and the hierarchical impulses created by differences in ethnicity, gender, and parochial exclusivity. And he continues. Um, so basically he's saying we have to emphasize the city as a concentration of people and we have to break down the fact that citizens of cities have been fully removed from any participation in political civic duty. And he says what we have to do is sort of have a resurgence of this activity that right now we're all basically mindlessly navigating our life, uh, city life. And he called, he says co-dwelling, right? We're co-dwelling in the city, but we don't actually like live with one another. We're not interacting with one another. It's just cities full of millions of individual people that aren't actually being creative together or generating anything together or even having discourse with one another and the first step in his movement is to foster this within the cities. So what do you think about this? Uh, again, there's a lot there. Like the, I guess I'll kind of segue from your most recent thought on that regarding the city. I would argue that it's not even just the city. Like th this has infiltrated households, right? Like that 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 households are merely just co-inhabitants at this point, mm -hmm. right? Like the idea of of family, even if we want to use the ultra cliche Western notion of nuclear family is now more about cohabitation in many regards, right? From generation to generation to generation, right? Like we see this and part of it is um, this very urban, eh, urban, suburban mindset tied to, of course, uh, materialism and all of those things, right? Like a new understanding of the public sphere, even regarding social media, all of that kind of works together to create this weird sort of individualism, even within the household. And of course, if you extrapolate that into cities of millions, it's going to be the same thing in the cities, right? There is, there is lack of a community, um, even if you Again, suburbia actually also fits the mold as well. How many of uh, our, our suburb, suburban people know like their neighbors and block parties? And maybe we're romanticizing like this whatever 1950s, 60s idea of the suburban like whatever what it was supposed to be like utopia, especially given that that utopia was not really a utopia, especially if you were a person of color or in many cases a woman or something along those lines. But still like this idea of being with people, not like just being around people, but being with people, right? Like, And I, I fully think that's what, what needs to happen. The earlier part that you were talking about regarding like how we use the space in the cities was very interesting to me because I had a pretty cool quote from a student yesterday. I think we were doing uh, a unit on colonialism or something along those lines. And, you know, I was mocking uh, the idea of going to Mars and because they were talking about the most recent uh, what SpaceX launch or, or something along mm -hmm. those lines. And, and yeah, I mean, I freely admit that I, I called that just like that is a... Uh, I don't remember my exact language, but yeah, is that the best endeavor? Is that the best way to spend our time, effort? Like, is that something that's worth it? Mars is, is not really habitable. Like, you can't do it. We're not going to be able to pull it off the way people think regarding, but regardless, it was a colonial mentality. That was, I, that's what we were talking about. And a student chimed in that knows much more about science th than I do. And he, he's like, yeah, you're, the word you're looking for is Mars can't be terraformed. And I was like, okay, terraformed. And then he said something very profound to me. He's like, shit, how can we even terraform Mars when we haven't figured out how to terraform Earth? And I thought that was like a pretty cool statement because there's a lot packed into just, you know, a very short little quote from him. And that's the idea of, if, if, and I don't want to, you know, make language for Bookchin in there, in here, but if he's arguing that the next step in our social evolution is to be able to terraform our cities, then I would be, that would be something that we actually, I would agree with. We have to do. And there are certain cities, examples in, in, in Germany that are being better at this. Uh, you know, Costa Rica went, what was it, two years ago? They went something like, I don't want to misquote it, but three, four months on, on completely renewable energy, something mm -hmm. somewhere along those lines, right? There are, there are efforts being made, but I would argue there are just as many counter efforts and those counter efforts are still exponentially more powerful. Um, and, and and that's where we have to talk. Hopefully he has ideas in there on how we can challenge these counter efforts from these systems of power, these capitalist systems of power, whether it's 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 oil money or current governments. Uh, again, U.S. government, U.K. government would be two highly problematic governments regarding this. So, yeah. So he talks a lot about, I don't want to read the whole quote here, but how in the beginning, citizens of a city had a moral obligation to participate in the politics of the municipality and to protect the well-being and the safety of all other citizens. But his main point is that this slowly over time has eroded away 
to a point where like we don't even remember that that was a thing, obviously, and none of us feel a moral obligation to our fellow citizens or to take part in the political process or manage the day to day activities of the city in a way that protects the safety and well being of everyone else that lives there. And his his theory of communalism is that we need to foster that and recreate that um, that sense of moral obligation to take care of each other within the city. Um, so the next point is, he says, communalism seeks a democratic collectivist social order. Quote, communalists seek to create a democratic collectivist social order. Communalism calls for the full administrative coordination of all public enterprises by confederal committees, whose members are the responsible voices of the popular assemblies. Without the assent of the citizenry as a whole in a confederation-wide vote, no policy-making confederal decision can be valid. So here we get into the political theory. Um, we'll go through the tactics in a second, but basically his theory is that all power should be put into public assemblies uh, based on various things. And that this idea of like a representative democracy with city council members and like all of this stuff, that needs to be eroded. And that the city should be fully ruled and run by these collection of uh, confederations at the neighborhood level and these public assemblies where we can have this discourse, public discourse, and the decisions will be made coming out of these committees and assemblies rather than the politicians. The Which is histor politicians. historically, is that's not even like a super novel idea, right? Like Cleisthenes broke Athens up into into these things called demis. Or some argue that's where we got the word, of course, democracy from, right? Like, uh, what was it? Like the tribunes in the Roman Republic, right? Like the plebeian tribunal and, of course, the military tribunal. These things already existed. Um, our overly romanticized First Nations examples of like the Iroquois League of Peace and Power that we've brought up in prior episodes of how they used to have these councils um, where they would, any important decision. It doesn't matter what that decision was. Any important decision, of course, was put into these council hands, and these councils had to answer to just about every member of the nation. So it's not even a wholly original idea. I mean, we're looking back at at, at, at history in this regard. The difficult part uh, that I'm hoping we find out about is how do you now apply that to, in this case, if we're talking about a municipality the size of maybe uh, I don't even know. Let's let's use local. Let's stay local. Like, let's say Denver. What is it in the metro area? Three, three and a half million people in the metro area. How do you apply it to that number of human beings? That, that'd that be the interesting piece. So, Well, you didn't know this because you haven't read this reading, but he actually uses Greece as the example. Okay, cool. Like, Sweet. When people had moral duty, he uses Greece as the example, but that, that eroded away and like we need to go back. Well, to and even in that example, right? Like like for a while there, the, the electoral, there was no even electoral process for these councils, right? It was all done by lottery. So, and oftentimes Times it was either annually or biannually. So you had a vested stake to quote unquote stay up on the issues because you didn't know when you were going to be serving, right? It was completely random. Some say it's kind of like a draft, being drafted into this position, but it makes it it naturally cultivates a vested stake in being abreast of the hot topics of the time. So it, yeah, you definitely are gonna have more active citizens there. So the next question is what happens to property? Here's a quote on that. He says property in a communalist society will be municipalized and its overall management placed in the hands of popular assemblies. So basically all property is controlled by the city, which is controlled by the people, by these popular assemblies. What do you think about that? I think that's interesting. I, I'm trying to remember exactly how, what is it, the 49th District in Chicago, that experiment that was running, I don't know, at least a decade, decade and a half ago, where they actually had distributed. I don't, they were making every choice, but I think it was budget based choices mm -hmm. that they had the direct democracy in. And the evidence at that time revealed that, yeah, people were more interested. People were engaged. They got out together and met each other and worked together to clean up parks and, well, they shoot, create parks, then clean, keep them clean um, and determine where the budget would be best spent. So, yeah, naturally, like, again, you see that engagement. People uh, – it fosters agency is the word we like to use oftentimes in class for these individuals. Mm -hmm. I think it's cool. Interestingly, in Colorado Springs, like – Colorado Springs Utilities is a municipally owned utilities company. The difference here between what Bookchin would want and what exists in Colorado Springs is that the city council members, the board of Colorado Springs Utilities is comprised of the city council members. So in theory, it's like a representative board of directors, right. but that has obviously its whole host of problems on its own. So. The difference is for communalism... Well, and the monetization of the position. Not the monetization. I'm not sitting here and saying our city council members are well paid for their position as city council members. You obviously... Everyone knows that's not a thing. 
but even the campaign process, as you personally experienced, is monetized so that mm-hmm. you can have that position. And then, of course, are you really – who are your stakeholders? Are they the citizens of, in our town, Colorado Springs? Or are they – well, we know the Koch brothers, for example, invested in certain candidates uh, mm-hmm. when you were running. Um, so, yeah, like who are the stakeholders here? Yeah, yeah. totally. Um then he says this requires consti- a constitution and laws, and this is a, the first big break with anarchism that we're going to see. So he says, um, quote, pragmatically, a commu- communalist polity requires a written constitution and, yes, regulatory laws to avoid a structurelessness that would yield mindless anarchy. The more defined the rights and duties of citizens are, the more easily they can be upheld as part of the general interest against the intrusion of petty tyrannies. Historically, constitutions and laws have been oppressive, often grossly so, but this raises the question of their content, not the fact of their existence. And indeed, only a peculiar, peculiarly egocentric mentality will assume that a rationally constituted society and a rationally formulated body of laws must necessarily violate personal autonomy and hence social freedom. Now I'm getting a little hesitant. The minute you start, <laughs> yeah, the minute you start writing down laws, right? Thanks, Hammurabi, way back in the day. Um, yeah, the minute you start writing down laws, you're seeking some sort of, again, you're seeking permanence. You're lacking the ability to be malleable and to be able to um, adapt to situations that are naturally going to be happening. Um, we see that with basically every constitution that's ever been been written, dating back to, of course, the Athenian example through Rome, through, of course, uh, the, you know, the United Kingdom and then eventually the United States and so on and so forth. Like what you do is, yeah, you, you start to create, there becomes an aura like around this document the document itself becomes something that is that is holy and something that should be venerated rather than a piece that is merely a guide in my opinion in fact here's the thing like i guess before i even go too far like guide is even pushing it too far if i'm honest i I, in my vision i don't see any written law i guess in my dream vision i don't know that that's possible we have to of course uh be able to navigate between like what your utopia is and what reality dictates so and and that's where we often find ourselves oscillating between uh both you and i like this is what we want but can we actually have that has history bore this out could we have a rational uh society that works together and gives people agency and and have that happen without having guidelines, without an outline. Can we even do that in a classroom with students when we assign something? Here, write me something on whatever. Write me something on social movement. Well, we would then get 70 emails asking for a guide sheet and a rubric and blah, 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 blah. Like that, I guess... But is that because our I'm students- hesitant. I'm hesitant right now. Like, I don't know which way to go. A, I hate law. I hate any form of written law. That's my dream. But B... Is that real in the example I gave of a, a, a moderately sized city like Denver, something with three and a half million people, or at least in the metro area, including the suburbs, of course. But yeah, like, is that a thing? I don't know. I'll admit, too, this was my first big sort of red flag, uh, pun intended. Um, but the reason that I actually like communalism, that I thought a lot about it, is because it's specifically what you said, where like my utopia vision and like my real life vision, I try to like reconcile the two and it's often impossible. The reason I appreciate this is because I think it's a practical real world, something that could actually happen. Right. Like when we start having conversations about like in 2019, the proletariat overthrowing the bourgeoisie, like that's utopic. Right? Yeah. Like that's, that's ridiculous. Not that is a thing. ludicrous but thing to, to talk about. This is something still. that could absolute that could actually potentially happen in real life. I have some critiques obviously at the end, but, um, Anyways, okay, so laws we have a problem with as should be shocking to no one. Um, Okay, then he goes into, basically, I broke it down into, uh, I think, like a nine-point plan or something as I was reading through. Um, That's actually kind of, yeah, anyways, I'll just dive right into it. So he says, first step, form study groups. He says, to begin with, politically concerned individuals who feel the need to explore communalist ideals and practices may form a study group in a given neighborhood or town. Shit, we're already there. What is this podcast? Yeah. The study group seeks to inform and develop those interested in social and political change into fully competent individuals and leaders. So that's step one. That's nothing new, obviously. People do this all the time. Number two, enter into the community. And this one I like. The study groups, whose members are now composed of individuals who are committed to a serious exploration of ideas, 
should begin to function within the neighborhood, town, or city in which they are located. They seek to enter and remain in the public domain, to be a continual revolutionary presence by virtue of their ideas, their emphasis on organization, their methods, and their goals. Communalists refuse to withdraw from the public domain in the name of individual sovereignty, artistic expression, or self-absorption. They wear no ski masks, either metaphorically or physically, and do not allow mindless, dogmatic assumptions and simplifications to stand in their way. He's killing my Zapatistas. Mm-hmm. He's killing them. Yeah. Um, hard pass. Like, I mean, I don't think that there can be... I mean, again, these points, I get what he's trying to accomplish, but they seem sort of like... They're making certain assumptions that people... <laughs> can do these things, but the people that I think he's assuming can do these things come from some sort of privileged area that maybe others... Yeah, I mean, especially regarding the mask situation, right? Like, that you can't expect everybody to be part of this process um, the same way. That's, I guess, the issue. Well, so... So the transition is a process. Once you get to the community, perhaps then you can work on it. But the yeah. transition as a process, like, yeah, you're coming from very different points of departure, right? Let me be blunt. If you are a white, straight male, you could probably pull this off, like, again, without any... In a different way in our society than you could if you were a, a female person of color or something along those lines, mm-hmm. right? Like, so, so to assume everybody can just kind of be able to do the same thing in the transition process is problematic. So to defend him slightly, he doesn't assume that. So what is he saying? Maybe I'm misconstruing. Not everyone has to take part. Okay, in this maybe I'm misconstruing what he's saying. Yeah. So there needs to be a vanguard. We'll get Do there. I want to use that word? Not Do I want to use that? But we'll get there. Okay. okay. All right. Number three: formulate a concrete program. Quote: The organization's goals should be carefully formulated into a concrete program based on communalist principles that consistently demands the formation of policy-making municipal popular assemblies. As a component of a minimum program, no issue is too trivial for communalists to ignore, be it transportation, recreation, education, welfare, zoning, environment, housing, public safety, democracy, civil rights, and the like. And then I have 3A. He mentions working with other groups, which I kind of liked. On specific issues, such as globalization, environmental problems, ethnic and gender discrimination, communalist organizations freely enter into coalitions with other organizations to engage in common struggles but they should never surrender their ideological or organizational independence or their claim to their own independent action. Their identity, ideas, and institutions are their most precious possessions and must never be impugned in the interests of unity. Yeah, I mean, it kind of, you know, calms the tensions for people that might assume some of these movements, these movements, if they move forward, are like separatist or isolationist or or something along those lines. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, the all of those points are good as far as like any topic being uh, relevant for people to decide on together. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, it does kind of open the way for maybe some um, uh, some way for the 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 assumed hierarchy that would form i know it's not supposed to be but i kind of feel like there would be at least initially an assumed hierarchy oh, hold on because i'm gonna get to that in a oh second. okay to maybe infiltrate maybe uh private matters on certain regards like i said i mean it's it's kind of open in that regard but um i have this as number four by the way i made up these nine points just pulling them out of the reading so it's not like he provided this nine point plan he didn't have a graph no <laughs> he should have had bullet points yeah Um, Number four, transitional programming. My note here is escalating from reform to revolution. So this is what he says, quote, while working on these issues, they always seek to enlarge them, they being the communalist, to reveal through a transitional program their deep-seated roots. They escalate cries for reforms into radical demands, seeking to expand every civil and political right of the people by creating the institutional power to formulate decision-making policies and see to their execution. The implications of solving these problems is a call for revolution in uh, social relations. That is, the achievement of a maximum program based on the confederation of municipalist assemblies in which property is steadily municipalized and subjected to coordination by confederal administrative bodies. I love it. I love it. It's kind of like... You're not forming the the revolution. The proletariat isn't throwing off their chains in that like kind of regard. It's a different type of revolution. And this, in in you you are creating with these councils in the municipality, right? Like this, 
this reflexive relationship where there is, there's like communal back scratching going on. You can only do that if you have these relationships established. So in this way, the revolution merely delegitimizes in this case, since we're always talking about it, the state by merely like, again, making demands, but you can make those demands if you have enough allies and, and this is the thing I'm hoping he gets to, you stop participating in the state. So if this, so in this regard, it would be like a neighborhood in, in, again, we keep using Denver or Colorado Springs as the example because that's where, where we're at. But right, that would be like an entire area of town working together and merely just doing things together and delegitimizing the state by no longer using the state apparatus and any of its like arms, right? Any of its, any of it, any, any of its tentacles would be probably a better word for, for it than arms, right? So you start finding ways to produce your own food. You start finding ways to access your own water. And yes, you're going to get like, again, you're going to get the attention in this case of utilities companies or grocers or whoever. But at that point, like that's how you delegitimize is you just keep doing it regardless of what potential sanctions may come because those sanctions are not going to hit an entire community. Those sanctions will hit individuals if individuals are trying to do these types of things, but they will not hit an entire community. To be blunt, our current states don't have the balls to do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the other problem is the individuals don't have the balls to ever actually do it, to ever actually just to have that agency. So I'm glad that he has these points, but now we have to talk about how you how you actually form these relationships. The thing I appreciate about this point is what we talk about all of the time is continually escalating the problems until you get to the point that is the actual source of the problem and not just a symptom of the problem. Like if we use whatever he says, transportation here, right? Yes, of course, we need to address the issue of transportation, but the communalist project is to continually escalate that issue until we get at the real root of why don't we have ac uh, adequate public transportation and so that's what he's suggesting here, which I think we both appreciate because that's one of our biggest critiques of movements nowadays, uh, addressing symptoms rather than problems. Um, number five is to hold public forums. Quote, the communalist organization, while always retaining its identity and program, initiates regular public forums to engage in discursive, face-to-face -face democratic exploration of ideas, partly to spread its program and basic ideas and partly to create public spaces that provide venues for radical civic debate until actual popular assemblies can be established. Nice in theory. I guess here's one thing as I kind of think about like the traditional reaction of states um, over the last four or five decades. Again, particularly, of course, here in the West, we, we argue, of course, the right to peaceably assemble and things along those lines are protected. Or, of course, in France to challenge your systems of power under the third part of the rights of man and citizen. But but increasingly, like the police state is making these types of things more and more difficult, right? Like, I mean, we just got done having a conversation with another uh, a colleague here uh, about Standing Rock and the use of LRADs and those types of things. Well, that was public discourse taking place right there. Um, um, clearly in protest at this point to a specific uh, uh, topic. That was, of course, the running of a pipeline through um, sacred land. But regardless, we saw the reaction. It was overwhelming force. So what kind of protections would be there? In this case, our, our states have proven that no amount of people at that point is too many for them to use outright violence. And then, of course, the response from those at these public events is panic, fear. And, and, and so they win. They, they run home. They don't want to be arrested. They don't want to. Get... So that's I mean, it's nice on a piece of paper. How can we make it applicable? Mm -hmm. Okay, number six. This is where we take a hard dive for me personally, but he says participation in municipal elections. Yeah, hard dive for me too. Yeah. Don't vote, kids. Um, so, quote, while it will clearly become involved in local issues, its primary focus should be the public domain where real power is vested, municipal elections, which allow for a close association between communalist candidates for city council or their equivalents and the people. The ablest members of the commun communalist organization should stand in municipal elections and call for the changing of city charters so as to legally empower the municipal assemblies. Now, this is where he addresses your comment of like, clearly not everyone's going to be equally want to stand out in the public and make these claims. But he says in the beginning, it's the ablest members that will go out and uh, run for the municipal positions in the municipal elections. Now, then he says that's only what you could do if you can legally change the charter through the action of like a city council. He says if legal changes are not possible, 
Um, quote, where no city charter exists that can be changed electorally, communalists should attempt both educationally and organizationally to convene direct democratic assemblies on an extra legal basis, exercising moral pressure on statist institutions in the hope that people will, in time, regard them as authentic centers of public power with the expectation that they can thereby gain structural power. Communalism never compromises by advocating delegated or statist institutional structures, and in contrast to organizations such as the Greens, it refuses to exist within the institutional cage of the nation-state or try to gild it with reforms that ultimately simply make the state more palatable. So he's basically saying here in what I've numbered number six, that the strategy is to from the people from the communalist movement to win elections and take positions of power within the city and then change the city charter to actually, in a legal sense, give the power to the people's assemblies. So what do you think about that? No, I don't agree with it. I don't agree, especially in our current systems here in the West, that that's even remotely a possibility. Like, it's nice and we all want to believe it, right? Especially over the last uh, couple of years, if anyone's been paying attention, right, with the political situation. Uh, that was obviously a poor joke. But regardless, like, even over the last, like, this last year where, quote unquote, the liberal left has been, you know, gaining ground both federally and locally, right? Like, and in states, right? That these are things that we assume, we want to assume, we've put our eggs in this basket, will lead to real lasting, uh, reform, at least. Not revolution, of course. You don't, you don't, you don't vote if you want to revolt. But regardless, like, these are things that we are hoping lead to real lasting reform, but we've been playing this broken record for the better part of two centuries and we're still on the same damn trajectory um and and so i don't see how more participation in a system that is meant to extrapolate things like competition and hierarchy and status and all of those things in any way shape or form um any participation in that is going to lead to any sort of change um and and the creation of some sort of communal communal state i don't see it Um, You can't update the city chargers that way. I don't think – I mean you can update the city chargers I suppose if you have every city council member. Um, But even if that's the case, states will step in. Um, We know this. Like there is a clear uh, uh, chain of command and a clear way of doing things um, that that power will not just willingly cede over. And that's one of, that's my biggest critique here also is aside from we're my, under the illusion of having any sort of say so and the fact that we vote is a it's a just a damn ritual to feed into this illusion. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah, like what were you going to say? Aside from my personal hatred for electoral politics, the problem I have with this is that politics even at the city level, it's not a political game, it's an economic game. And the people with the most money always win the economic game. So my question here would be, and my main critique is, how do these communalists with, I'm assuming, not nearly as much resources as the capitalists of the city uh, stand a chance in these city elections? And then even once they get elected, stand a chance in getting enough uh, votes to change a city charter or et cetera. Especially on... since like who they're competing with are the ones weaving the narrative, right? They, they, they've they infiltrated the K through 12 system and have been telling students in their ninth grade civics class that this is of course the perfect political situation. And the best thing you can ever do is vote and wear that stupid sticker at the end of the, uh, on, you know, every Tuesday evening, right? Like they, it's not just that you are, are, are challenging the system in that way, the people in the positions of power, you're challenging in this way the unwashed masses and you're not going to win. You're not going to win those unwashed masses, right? They are going to have to be coursed through given actual real alternatives. So the second part is what I agree with. You need to create real alternatives. You need to create what we'll be talking about in a future episode like Cooperation Jackson, like real alternatives um, or even historically speaking, right? You need to create. There's a pope and there's an anti-pope. Sorry, it's investiture, mm-hmm. investiture controversy stuff. But yeah, like that was a that was a legitimacy thing, right? Regarding the investiture controversy, right? You have a emperor and you have an anti-emperor, and you have a pope and an anti-pope, and they're naming these different positions basically to to try and and win the hearts and minds of the people. One for the church, one for, of course, the 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 the, the non. 
the non-ecclesiastical leadership, right? Like that's what that was. And of course, the legitimacy eventually went back to the church. That's fine. They were able to, to, to co-opt the program. Or even another good example of this is where a new capital was formed during Turkey's war for independence, right? Right. You have Istanbul had been the traditional capital of the Ottoman Empire, but Mustafa Kemal Ataturk and of course his cohorts are looking to delegitimize the current situation. So he just starts a new capital in Ankara, which to this day is still the capital. And slowly but surely, through, of course, in this case, some combat as well and, and violence, that becomes the legitimate hub, the legitimate center of political uh, of the political process, which is kind of interesting because the other city remained the, the commercial center. But it, again, these are there, there are examples throughout history where there are certain places and institutions of power and rival institutions have sprung up and have been able to gain gain the legitimacy over time. Yeah, no argument there. I am much more compelled by the extra legal yeah. strategy than the actual taking part in municipal elections because it's just such a huge drain on time and resources for any organization that it ends up, in my opinion, at least being an absolute waste of time. I would much rather invest in creating the alternate institution that has, in the end, more power uh, than the traditional political structure. Right. And the examples I gave are also trying to create states in power. So they're not like examples that I would like agree with their dis, they're like what they were actually like their dialectic and what they were trying to accomplish. But the mere fact that their action was to create these extra legal ways of doing things, mm -hmm. that's something that, that, that has been tried and, and proven. Okay. His number seven is to form public assemblies. So he says this can happen at any time in the process, but Specifically, if you've gotten political power or even extra political power, you'll need to form public assemblies where the people come together and they hash out and decide on political uh, civic issues. Everything from transportation to blah, 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 everything he listed before. I mean, this is the day-to-day -day management of the city. These public assemblies will handle this. He does address specifically, I have this as 7A, what if no one participates in these public assemblies? This is what he says. If a majority of a neighborhood, town, or city choose to attend an assembly meeting and become participants in making important decisions, all the better. But if only a few are sufficiently interested in the political fate of their community to attend it, so be it. The assembly's decisions carry the same weight, regardless of whether the number of people present is a dozen, a hundred, or several thousand. Political decisions should be made by politically involved citizens. Under no circumstances should poor attendance be a public assembly uh, sorry, under no circumstances should poor attendance at a public assembly be an excuse to abandon a direct and discursive democracy in favor of anonymous voting at polls, which renders politics impersonal and non-discursive. Mm, I don't know that I have a lot to, to, to really build upon there. I mean, it's interesting in a way. I don't know. I mean, one thing that I do like here, which is not unique to Bookchin, but this idea of discursive democracy, because one of the theories against the democracy that we have now, which I, I strain to even call democracy, but it's it, to use his word, it's non-discursive, right? We all watch the television ads and the television debates, and then we go and like check a little box and put it in a box, and then we know who wins. And you don't even talk hey, about don't this. With the, like, don't forget the sticker, man. Yeah. You don't even talk about it like barely at all with your friends. And like, you don't have debates about like, it's just personal individual decision that basically your individual opinion has no bearing on the outcome so it's completely non-discursive i do this I is don't think, i think there is lively debate but that lively debate is not centered on issues that lively debate is centered on like emotional topics i do true. think i do think there is debate like to insinuate I fully disagree. There's debate between the candidates, and we see it on television, but no one's sitting around their dinner table being like, who are you voting for? Oh, I'm voting for this person, and they're having intellectual, rational debates about politics. That never fucking happens. I think I've seen it happen quite a bit, or maybe I've just experienced it quite a bit. I've seen it happen, and then, of course, then, then everybody finds out, at least in my own personal experience, that, that I'm not doing that. And then that opens up a whole new debate. Well, you, you, if you're not voting, you can't complain, right? The old cliche, like, adage or, you know, America, love it or leave it, you pinko, commie, punk, or something along those lines. Something super, like, right? Yeah, yeah. whatever, yeah. Yeah. I do think that it's more appealing to have a democratic process where everyone's physically present in a location to make decisions and hash things out with their neighbors. Like, I think that's... That's appealing. Whether that's real life or not is a whole other conversation. Yeah. Number eight, this is another hard dive for me, but it doesn't matter, is to establish leaders in the movement. Quote, 
A serious libertarian organization would establish not only leaders, but also means by which the membership may recall leaders who view, whose views and behaviors they oppose, and effectively modify their activities. On the other hand, frivolous opposition to leaders for its own sake should never be tolerated. One of the most scandalous features of anarchist organizations, when they exist, has been the dizzying individualism that promote, permits neurotic personalities to disrupt meetings and activities as expressions of selfhood. Uh, okay, so first and foremost, like his use of the word libertarian, just like he would accuse the Marxists of using words that are dead, that word is dead to me. Well, he's talking about libertarian socialism in this case. Got it. Still yeah. dead because of its connotations. Sorry, the word's been hijacked by very different people with different ideology, and thus that has killed the word. You're going to have to find something else or you are going to confuse your audience. Yeah, that word's got to go. So again, libertarian, whether we like it or not, has been taken and co-opted by other groups and so should no longer be used. I, I refuse to use it regarding what, what they're trying to accomplish here. Like, that can't be a thing, right? Like, these, whatever. That's a whole different topic, but that's the first thing. That language is gone. Secondly, regarding leadership, yeah, like you said, hard dive. I don't know that leadership is... I mean, I guess just I just I just debate that leadership for certain issues, what I've seen, again, historically speaking, is necessary, right? You cannot... Some certain situations just require somebody to just step up and 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 take one for the team and guide people, whatever that might be. A CEO in a in a military, you can't vote on every topic, right? When you're under fire or something along those lines, or in in sports or something along those lines, right? Like sometimes we just need leadership, even of course our romanticized primitive indigenous, whatever we want to call them, right? These anarchists of the past, even they of course had positions where people would just rise to the occasion. How they make sure there were always checks and balances to ensure that wasn't a thing. Right now, I don't see that there was any way for these leaderships to be checked except for people to be voicing in what he calls a frivolous manner their concerns with the leadership. Essentially, we're looking to silence those voices because they are representative of like some individualistic selfhood is what he used. I, I, that seems wildly problematic again. Like, no, so what he's saying is... I mean, here he's attacking, like, egoist anarchism. And he's saying you absolutely cannot let these meetings be derailed by the anarchist that's going to stand in the crowd and to all ends fight the fact that there might be a leader. He's saying that has to be eliminated right off the bat or we'll get nowhere. But And he does address your previous point. I mean, it's not specific. He doesn't give us, like, a guideline or anything. But he says the leaders must be recallable by the membership of the public assemblies at any time. I mean, this is the classic anarchist debate of like between the individualist anarchist and like the theory that, like you just said, sometimes there needs to be leaders. And if we all voluntarily enter into a situation where we have decided this person is an expert and should be a leader, then what's the problem with that? You know what I mean? Well, and sometimes the situation just calls for it. Like, again, should we create, like, whatever, some sort of art curriculum at the community level? Yes, naturally, the person with art talent should take the leadership in that cre in the creation of this program. Right. And there in shouldn't even be a debate. That would be, like, a consensus thing. Like, we trust person X to... To, to, to lead this artistic program in our municipality. So that's what he's suggesting is that yeah. at the public assemblies, the same thing could happen. We would all vote and like we support person X to be the leader of this assembly. And any time we can recall them if we disagree with what they're doing in their leadership capacity. That's basically what he's saying. One of my critiques, though, is that this is ripe for corruption, very clearly, especially in modern right. times. Like, yes, maybe that could have worked back with like the Iroquois example that you give, you know, in class or whatever. But now it's highly questionable for me whether or not I mean, I feel like that would be immediately corrupted, but whatever. We've I mean, seen it happen in organizations that we will not name names, like, you know, very close to our community that were cry trying to create egalitarian, uh, well, at first organizations, and then, of course, take it to the, 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 the city level, and then, of course, maybe even bigger and better than that. But even in this case, we've seen this happen in these very organizations, mm -hmm. um, and it breaks them apart every single time. Yep. Okay, so that was number eight. Number nine, maintain a commu the communalist philosophical outlook. He says, quote, Finally, communalism is not simply a vehicle for establishing a communalist polity and the appropriate, appropriate institutions. It is also an outlook that includes a philosophical approach to reality as well as society and toward the natural world as well as human development. 
It contends that the ongoing crisis in our culture and values stems not from an overabundance of civilization, but from an insufficiency of it. It defends technological development used rationally and morally as reducing labor and creating free time that potentially allows citizens to participate in public affairs, time for creativity, a reasonable abundance in the means of life, and even in a rational and ecological society, the ability to improve upon the impact of natural forces. Post-scarcity abundance, not to be confused with the mindless consumerism fostered by capitalism, must be wisely tempered and controlled by municipal assemblies and the free confederal institutions that an emancipated society can create. So he's basically saying the last thing you have to do as part of this movement is maintain this philosophical outlook. You have to keep thinking in these ways much bigger, much beyond just the local municipality and the local polity that you will have created through this movement. Which is nice. I mean, the technological advancement, looking out, the idea of advancement for looking out, we, again, the philosophy has to be very different than consumptive, but more like, again, the egalitarian world outlook. It's the old cliche. Right now we have the technology and the advancement to feed seven and a half billion people uh, on this planet. Why are we not doing so? Some would argue it's the philosophy. It's, it's, it's it, the philosophies that are attached that are, of course, upholding systems are the reasons why that's not happening. Um, and capitalism being paramount of the, of, among those. However, I am still a little bit hesitant. Um, and this is why sometimes you accuse me of being uh, maybe an anarcho primitivist, but the idea of advancement for advancement's sake um, is, is very capitalist. Even if there is no consumption aim at, at the end, I, I still think like, again, maybe we're advancing it philosophically for the betterment of our fellow humans. Um, I, I don't I mean, know. Here, I mean, it goes back to like the, the whole Marx thing, right? Like where, 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 where Marx would argue that we, we need that capitalism is, ne is a necessary step for his communist vision because capitalism will provide us the innovative tools that will make communism a reality. Well, it's already done that, right? We could have a direct democracy in every nation on this planet. Well, we, would, we don't even need nations, but that's a whole different story. But technically, we could have a direct democracy everywhere, right? We have cell phones. Capitalism has given us all of this technology, the internet, blah, 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 blah. Regardless, every decision made at a national, a state, a provincial, a city, a county level could be made by every citizen of that place mm -hmm. via the cell phone. Why is it not happening? Well, that's what he's saying we should do, basically. Okay, that's what he's saying we should do. We already have that power. Why are we not doing it? He's arguing it's philosophical. I mean, he's arguing it because we need to seize power at the municipal level, and then we can implement policies that would bring that about. That's where you and I have a problem with that. I do want to say, though, he's not saying technological advancement purely for the sake of progress on its own, right? He says specifically here, reducing labor time, creating free time, creativity time, time to participate in public affairs, uh, reasonable abundance in the means of life, and a rational and ecological society. With the philosophical change. How do you mm -hmm. implement the philosophical change? So yes, again, numerous societies of the past have reached points of sustainability in terms of like their advancement and how they were able to, again, stay, have this reciprocal relationship with the world around them, with the people around them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Numerous societies have achieved that. But yes, those societies found some sort of magic area of advancement and kind of kind of I don't want to say stayed static because that's kind of a derogating term but like hovered in that zone right how do we get there given the philosophical socialization well, shoot indoctrination of the capitalist mindset we have now that's generational. Like that first generation is not going to even understand that, right? So that's a generational program. So you're going to have to implement, in this case, an education system, right? A system of education that champions this type of philosophy and is taking, again, one generation to a level. That generation will take them to another level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until we get back to this more circular mindset regarding how we do things, whether it's technologically, whether it's, of course, distribution of resources, whether it's maintaining reciprocal relationships. Like that's going to that you cannot do that overnight. There is no, there is no switch. Even those of us that want to consider ourselves more community minded or anarchist minded, or even the communists out there that th still think it's a possibility. We think we want those things only because we don't have those things. I do find it hard to believe you and I included, if we were put in that situation, if we would overnight be able to just be like, I don't know what's a good example I have a car here. My Here are the keys to my car. Now not in my pocket, but set on some sort of desk, right? Like, does that make sense? So we're instantly, we're ready for this, this whole transition. 
I know that that I'm kind of like maybe grasping at, at some interesting like anecdotal like ideas here tied to my own personal beliefs but well, i think you've taken us in another direction like that's not at all what he is saying you and i both have a problem with like the anarcho primitivist mindset but that's not what he's saying at all he's saying that techno technology should be advanced and developed but it should only be advanced and developed to increase the quality of life for people globally so no i perfectly understand what he's saying i'm arguing the idea of advancement for improving the quality of life has already been co-opted by the capitalist mindset and so for that to actually to separate the two but i think he would argue that it actually the technological advancement has not been to increase the quality of life it's been for profit and that's the problem okay Yes, that's what it has been for. However, we are dealing with millions of human beings who have been socialized into thinking that the newest LG is an actual improvement for humanity. Does that make sense? No, and I get what that, you're saying. And yeah. you're going to have to break the two apart. I mean, that's exactly what he's saying in number nine. Yes. Yeah. So I'm saying that part is important, but what I'm questioning is how you... You're not going to do this overnight. Like, that's going to be a generational process. So I agree with the fact that you're going to have to do this to break the philosophy. And that's the way you get advancement to advancement for the real improvement of humanity rather than the illusion of the improvement mm -hmm. of humanity. But I think we're sometimes naive thinking, again, even those of us that want this, like, right this second could make that, like, transition. No, like, I don't, agree. yeah, I don't, that's but what I'm I saying. I don't think that he's suggesting that. That's why it's the last thing. No, I'm not even saying he suggested yeah. that. I'm just raising critiques for, for our audience that are probably having questions. Yeah. I mean, he's saying, <laughs> this is how you overnight, in th like, in quotes, relatively overnight can gain power and give it to public assemblies. But then the last thing you need to do is exactly what you were saying, maintain and change this philosophical outlook. So that technological advancement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything right. you just said. Yeah. All right. We'll stop there. Cool. Uh, brief overview of Bookchin's communalism. Um, we actually wanted to have this conversation because we are exploring, we're going to be talking about in future episodes, uh, Kurdish autonomous movements and Ocalan's democratic confederalism, et cetera. So this is sort of laying the groundwork for those conversations. Um, so thank you for listening to this episode of Revolution and Ideology. You can get with us on revolutionandideology.com. If you want to email us, you can do that at hello at revolutionandideology.com. Uh, once again, I'm Nick Lee. And I'm Jared Benson. We'll talk to you next time. Out. Oh.